Good afternoon, everyone, and um, thanks to the Assembly and the organisers of the uh, seminars for inviting us to, the, um, to Stormont to provide some information about this study. It's funded by the uh, Public Health Agency in Northern Ireland. Um, it's also part of a number of similar studies currently uh, underway and some others that have been completed in England and uh, in the Republic of Ireland. Um, I think, as far as I understand, there's a whole series of studies be, uh, planned and about to happen later this year uh, across Europe in eight different countries. So it's clearly an important issue and it's captured the imagination of policy makers. And, uh, and I hope, hopefully, the importance and the significance about transition from child and adolescent mental health care into adult mental health services become apparent as we go along. Uh, the study also represents an important um, collaborative effort, if you like. Um, it, uh, apart from myself and colleagues in UU, there are also people from uh, Q QUB, including Gavin here, and uh, Professor Swaran Singh. If you like, Swaran was the one who kick-started most of the interest in transition uh, studies. It has representation from the voluntary sector, uh, voices in young people in care, probably the most overworked uh, voluntary sector uh, in Northern Ireland. Um, it involves consultant psychiatrists and trainee psychiatrists across Northern Ireland, many of them who will be working with us and collecting data and helping the study along. The study began last year and it will run for three years and Sheena, my colleague, will tell you a bit more about that in the second part of this presentation. Um, there's a if you, <laughs> interesting, if you Google uh, for dodgy bridges, you'll find any God's amount of them, loads of them. So it's very interesting. I was going to put up the Carrick Reed Bridge, but I thought too many people get across to the other side quite safely. This one was uh, meant to convey something about the dangerousness of trying to get to the other side. Um, do you think I've succeeded, possibly? Um, Adolescence is a transitional period in life. Uh, it's, a, it's from puberty to adulthood. Normally, it's, it's acknowledged to be usually from 12 to 22 years, but of course, there's some variation uh, to the individual. It's characterized by marked physiological changes, and of course, where there's much more recognizable uh, sexual uh, feelings in the individual. It's a period when young people are trying to establish themselves as individuals uh, in their own right, trying to separate from parents very often uh, to construct identities, begin to understand who they are in reference to other members of the family, the parents, and the wider community. Of course, it's a period that can also have a very determining effect on one's life chances. So, I mean, most of us will remember school and trying to settle into school and develop an understanding of where we're heading in life and develop an occupational career, etc. And of course, these are all factors which are closely related to uh, developing good mental health or, uh, conversely, poor mental health over the life course. And of course, the world has changed uh, considerably over the past 10, 20 years. Huge technological advances, changes in communication, huge cultural changes. And I would say, uh, with some degree of certainty, that young people have been at the vanguard of those changes too. Um, so just to say what this presentation is about, we're going to give you the a research context, uh, the main research questions, there'll be a description of the methodology and an update. And just to say really that uh, we are in the early stages, there aren't any findings to present today, but it's just to give you an overview about the study and the context that we're uh, undertaking the study in. So uh, Jim, 
began his uh, introductory talk about the importance of mental health. And, and I think if we understand that the costs of mental illness to society are set to double uh, over the next 20 years, and it's a higher cost burden than most other uh, health problems, and yet paradoxically it achieves much less funding than any of the other uh, disorders and problems in our society, in, in health. Uh, and it certainly attracts much less research funding than the other health problems. And in Northern Ireland, that's much less again, probably half than that spent in the other UK regions. So again, just to back Jim's comments up, it is the Cinderella of the Cinderella uh, in child, child and adolescent mental health services. But it's also true that uh, very strong evidence to say that there's been increasing rates of mental illness in young people over the past 20 years. And as you see here, 13% uh, of boys uh, aged 11 to 16 and 10% of girls. And the main problems uh, would be described as conduct disorders, ADHD, the emotional disorders, depression, anxiety, uh, and the autistic spectrum disorders, ASD. Um, but it's also related to health inequalities, the issues around poverty, disadvantage, and parental illness, and in fact related very much to what Sander was pointing out earlier on with the looked after children. Um, so we ha see relationship to parental mental illness, uh, child abuse and trauma, um, being in a lone parent family, and drug and alcohol use. And of course, uh, of considerable importance here again, and in terms of the costs, most of the mental health problems, 75%, that we find that emerge in adulthood are already present before the age of 18. And that's a, a consistent finding across the world. It's extremely costly, again, uh, between 12,000 12, and 60,000 annually. And there are interventions, and that's possibly some of the importance of thinking about early intervention and looking at how we provide services to young people, is that the savings in, in terms of, a, a, for example, for conduct disorder prevented are estimated at £150,000 uh, per person uh, on an annual basis. So again, thinking about late intervention, we know that there are very high rates of uh, mental health problems amongst young people. But in fact, although, I mean, in fact, so some of that's between 20 and 25 percent. But we also know that um, very few uh, of the children or young people with a mental disorder ever reach services. Uh, we think that there's an estimation of about 10 percent of those people with a diagnosable disorder will ever be in contact with uh, health services, mental health services. Now, this may be just connected to uh, the stigma of mental illness. It may be to do with parental neglect or simply where uh, adults don't quite understand what the problem is, don't recognize it. Um, certainly, in my own research in London, uh, we were trying to understand why uh, the help, we were trying to understand the help seeking of young people uh, uh, around the age of 13 to 16. And in fact, what was surprising was that 30% of these children um, did not recognize their GP as uh, a support for mental health problems, that they wouldn't ever go and see them. Um, so there are clear issues about education around health services. And, and again, trusting any adult was a serious barrier to help seeking. Again, there's the problem of uh, service engagement. Uh, when a lot of you young people do reach services, quite a high proportion of them drop out of services. Uh, only later, I suspect, to emerge with more serious problems. And for some of them, uh, with the criminal justice system, again, you get the sense that these are an accrual of problems, storing things up for the long term, and ending up with greater costs. Then, of course, there's the problem of what to do with young people with neurodevelopmental problems who do get seen in calm services, 
but uh, tend not to be seen in adult services. Once they reach the age of 18, they're generally discharged uh, to the tender mercies of their GPs, who for the most part aren't terribly well equipped to deal with them. But they fall through the net and there are serious consequences for that. The uh, Regulation and Quality Improvement Authority, the RQIA, in an ind independently commissioned report came out in 2011, I think, um, made the point that uh, services in Northern Ireland were pretty patchy and inconsistent in their approach to the transition. And so we'll think about that in a little bit more detail. This is a quote from Swaran Singh, published in 2005. So what do we understand about transition services? So very little evidence about the magnitude of the problem, the outcomes uh, of people who fall through the care gaps, interventions that might improve the process, and the experiences of service users and carers about a transition. And for the most part, that's pretty much what we're trying to look at in this study. <clears throat> So what do we know from the evidence so far? We know that the, the protocols and the procedures for the transition between uh, child and adolescent and, mental, and adult mental health services are very often uh, missing. Uh, sometimes they are there but not adhered to, not followed. Um, we know that the service structures are very often quite different between different trusts. Certainly the structures but, uh, within adult mental health services and child and adolescent mental health services are very different. The cultures are very different as well. So if you can imagine uh, young people, I suppose sometimes these things are characterised uh, unfairly as good cop, bad cop, where uh, the young person is going through uh, in a very nurtured environment and then suddenly hits a brick wall which tends to be adult mental health service. But they do have quite different cultures um, and for that reason uh, young people tend to find them quite uh, a shock to the system once they arrive from one system to the other. And for the most part there isn't an awful lot of preparation uh, with the young people and their family in the transition. Resources I've already talked about, but again, resources uh, between trusts can be quite different as well. So you can imagine quite a lot of interface between, uh, the, resor uh, between the trusts here in Belfast and the voluntary sector, whereas in other parts of Northern Ireland, the voluntary sector won't be that apparent. And then again, the role of the parent and care within uh, child and adolescent services, uh, mental health services, the care, the parent is very much brought into the process and their feelings considered and taken on board. Once the pers young person reaches the age of 18 into adult mental health services, it's a completely different relationship. So the research questions for the study then are, what is the best way to organise mental health services for young people in Northern Ireland as they make a transition from child and adolescent to adult mental health services? We're going to look at issues around the health inequalities. So what are those factors that determine a, uh, a successful transition? Are they related to those issues around health, uh, inequalities, in society, the social inequalities and the issues around looked after children? Um, what are those factors that determine a good engagement with uh, services and the continuity of care? And then what are the barriers and facilitators to collaboration between adults, uh, child and adolescent mental health services and adult mental health services? So I'm now going to pass you over to Sheena. Thank you. Thanks, Jerry. Yeah, I'm just going to um, give you an overview of uh, the plan of investigation. Uh, for the study, it's uh, based on the track study in England, the same template, we're using the same template in terms of methodology, uh, extending it and adapting it for Northern Ireland. Uh, so it's in different stages. The first stage, I suppose there's been a preparatory stage in terms of a critical synthesis review done with the literature um, up to date. And then we're going to map the services in each of the five trust areas, what 
uh, currently happening in terms of procedures, protocols, policies, and uh, practice in each of the five trust areas. And also included in that will be the um, services provided by the community and voluntary sector and how they feed into the, the trusts and to the statutory services. The second stage of the process will be the retrospective case note review. And that will involve uh, going to look at the care pathways of young people who have been referred to CAMS uh, over a 48 month period. Um, we're going to look at the pathways and outcomes for a group using the case note review. Um, and that will involve the trainee psychiatrists that Jerry mentioned and the, a clinical studies officer who will be employed through the trust. Um, and we're also then on each of the five trusts we'll be looking at a group of young people who actually reached transition point and looking at what happened in terms of their referral from CAMS to adult services, whether the referral was made and what the outcome of that referral was or whether they were um, discharged at that stage. Out of that, we will then uh, be able to identify a smaller number who will be the focus of the third part of the study. So we're hoping that um, a small number of young people who have made the transition will agree to be interviewed for qualitative interviews and they will be a longitudinal um, part of the project, qualitative interviews over three time points. We'll interview uh, up to 15 young people, service users, 15 carers, parents or carers and um, clinicians who are involved in the care as well. So that's kind of just an overview of the timeline. Um, as Jerry said, the project started last year and is due to finish at the end of March in 2016. And each stage feeds into the next stage. So the mapping of the material, of the protocols, procedures, everything that has been happening to date and is currently happening or in development um, will form part of the first stage. Um, and then the track quest to say we're using the tools that have been used by Swaran Singh and his team in Ireland or in England, and they have been also used as part of the ITRAC study in the south of Ireland as well to do the exact same thing. Um, but then we'll have the focus groups with staff teams and individual interviews with CAMS and AMS, within CAMS and AMS, and the topic guide will be developed from the RQIA report and the results of our survey based on what we're finding from the case note review and the mapping stage as well. So that will inform the interviews, the qualitative interviews with the service users and with the staff teams. So just in terms of the case note review, which is kind of about to hopefully kick off fairly soon, um, First part of that will be all referrals over a 48 month period made to the Belfast and South Eastern Trust um, and that will involve taking notes from the archives uh, to look at what actually happened and it could be that young people just stay within the system or within the service for a short period of time. And then we'll also be able to identify out of that say the potential and actual referrals, young people who um, come to transition point and based on figures from the English study, uh, how many young people make that transition within uh, population size, equivalent to Northern Ireland, we're estimating that that will be about 168 young people. And yeah, qualitative interviews, 15 in each of the service users, carers and professionals. Um, and those interviews will be the topic guides Again, informed by what has happened in the uh, track studies, but also very much informed by the mapping and the case note review as well. And then the final part will be the analysis and write-up, and hopefully we'll be able to give findings at that point. And the research outcomes. Greater insight into the processes involved in transition from CAMS to AMS information on organisational issues, the barriers and facilitators to that process, and the outcomes for young people leaving CAMS. Also, the qualitative interviews will hopefully give a greater sense of the meaning and perspective of young people's sense of recovery and hope 
Um, and maybe that would be something that we haven't so much data on. And also the pathways for those with ASD. We'll kind of be uh, looking at that particular group as well in more depth. We're also hoping that one of the outcomes will be improved liaison and the role of the voluntary with the voluntary sector, how the voluntary sector um, can tie in with the statutory services and uh, maybe the exchange of services between the two and possibly a model of best practice for transition across all the trusts. And what we're hoping out of the study that we can avoid a pathway that looks something like this for young people. And I'm not sure what you Google to actually get this picture, but we're hoping that that won't be something that young people experience um, and that this pathway from transition from CAMS to AMS and care for young people um, needing mental health intervention will be much more straightforward and smooth and supportive. And that's just the contact details, so thank you very much. Thank you.